Um, I'm Dr. Anita Saxena, Associate Professor from the Department of Nephrology, SGPGI Lucknow, and I'll be speaking, speaking to you about nutritional requirements in chronic kidney disease. <clears throat> chronic kidney disease is defined as kidney damage for more than three months as defined by structural or functional abnormalities of the kidney with or without decreased GFR or GFR if it is reduced to 60 ml per minute with or without kidney damage. The management of disease depends on the stage of kidney disease. There are five stages of kidney disease. Stage one is kidney damage with normal or in increased GFR, that is uh, GFR is uh, more than 90 ml per minute. Stage two is kidney damage with mild reduction in GFR, that is 60 to 89 ml per minute. And stage three is moderate dec decrease in GFR, that is the GFR is between 30 to 59 ml per minute. And severe GFR, reduction in GFR is stage four, which is 15 to 29 ml of uh, GFR per minute. And stage five is called the kidney failure stage. That is, the GFR is less than 15 ml per minute. The patient may or may not be on dialysis. <coughs> Patients with progressive loss of kidney function often suffer a decline in the nutritional status. The nutritional status is defined as condition or situation related to degree of body nourishment. Deterioration of clinical nutritional status is characterized by a progressive weight loss, wasting of both fat and skeletal muscle tissues, and a reduction of serum proteins. Low serum albumin, low SG scores, low normalized protein intake, and low BMI are important independent nutritional risk factors for mortality in renal patients and reflect malnutrition. The term renal disease embraces a number of clinical conditions whose common feature is a decrease in GFR. Different clinical conditions like early and advanced renal failure on conservative treatment, nephrotic syndrome, maintenance dialysis, renal transplantation and acute renal failure differ with respect to pathophysiology and treatment. Another common feature that these conditions share is malnutrition, but each condition has a different approach in terms of nutritional therapy. So what are the problems unique to patients with chronic kidney disease? One is poor nutrition in general, late initiation of dialysis and inadequate dialysis, lack of proper diet counseling and poor monitoring of nutritional status, high incidence of infections, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, and cardiovascular involvement. Now, why do we need to modify diets? Basically, what happens is, as kidney disease progresses, the capacity to respond to changes in intake of nutrients and water become less, less flexible. Solute and water excretion per nephron increases, but the fewer number of functional nephrons leads to a more restricted range of solute or water excretion. Therefore, in kidney failure, nutritional therapy allows good control of several consequences of the disease. When diet exceeds dietary protein requirement, the excess protein is degraded to urea and other nitrogenous wastes, and these products accumulate in the body. Because the severity of uremic syndrome is proportional to the accumulation of these waste products and ions, therefore dietary intake needs to be adjusted. So as kidney disease progresses, metabolic changes take place in the body, so which include inflammation, which is encountered in about 30 to 50 percent of the patients, the IL-6 and the CRP levels are high, the oxidative stress is high, insulin resistance is more, there's impaired glucose metabolism, protein catabolism is increased, the endothelial function is impaired and the lipid abnormalities appear. So, progression of kidney disease causes activation of protein catabolism and we see that the plasma and intracellular components of amino acid pools are altered, amino acid oxidation is stimulated, tissue utilization of exogenously infused amino acid is impaired, amino acid transport into muscle is reduced, serum amino acid levels of phenylalanine, methionine, taurine, cysteine are elevated, there is decreased concentration of serum valine and leucine 
glutamine and non-essential amino acids in this condition become conditionally essential. So let's have a look at the glucose metabolism in this CKD patients. Kidney is responsible for 15 to 25 percent of gluconeogenesis, 10 to 20 percent of glucose uptake, and 30 percent of insulin catabolism. In CKD, cachexia and, mus and loss of muscle mass is because of fasting hyperglycemia, because of insulin resistance at tissue level, and loss of kidney function. The gluconeogenesis cannot be suppressed by exogenous glucose infusion. Rate of endogenous insulin secretion is low. There is decline in metabolic clearance of insulin. Insulin degradation is decreased in kidneys and the hepatic catabolism of insulin is also decreased. So what happens to the lipid metabolism in chronic kidney disease? Lipolysis is impaired which leads to plasma lipid changes. The plasma levels of triglycerides and VLDL are increased. Plasma levels of high density lipoproteins and LDL are decreased. There is reduced fat clearance following parenteral administration of lipids. Now fatty acid oxidation is preserved therefore lipids can be used as energy substrate in CKD. Now with this background let's have a look at the pathophysiology of protein energy wasting which is multifactorial. What happens in uh, CKD is malnutrition is caused due to uremic toxicity. Uremic toxicity causes anorexia, loss of taste and because of unpalatable diets the dietary protein and energy intake is reduced, inflammation, infection, superimposed illness, presence of comorbidity, metabolic acidosis, these all contribute towards development of malnutrition in CKD. The hormonal disorders like resistance to anabolic hormones, increased level of counter regulatory hormones like glucagon and PTH, declining residual renal function, anemia, these all contribute towards development of malnutrition. Now the dialysis dose if it is inadequate it leads to uremic toxicity and then the dialysis procedure itself is causes uh, loss of nutrients and water soluble vitamins and dialysate therefore malnutrition sets in. Now uremia and dialysis they cause chronic systemic inflammatory response syndrome which leads to reduced appetite, reduced physical activity, reduced whole body protein synthesis, increased whole body protein catabolism, hypoalbuminemia leading to malnutrition and subsequently volume expansion and there is increased pro-inflammatory catabolic cytokines. So in nutshell, the imbalance between nutrient intake and nutrient requirement causes malnutrition low protein and calorie intake is an important cause of malnutrition in chronic kidney disease. So what are the markers of protein energy malnutrition in CKD? They are insidious loss of body fat, somatic protein stores and energy reserves, diminished serum proteins, poor performance status and function. Now there are two types of malnutrition, one which is associated with uremic syndrome and the other which is associated with mal malnutrition, inflammation, atherosclerosis syndrome. So we'll talk about type 1 which is associated with uremic syndrome. In this you have serum albumin which is can be normal or can be low. The food intake is decreased, there is increased oxidative stress but this kind of malnutrition is reversed by dialysis and nutritional support. So when does protein energy wasting set in? Basically dietary protein and energy intake diminish long before end stage renal disease develops. Protein energy wasting is partially caused by inadequate nutritional management in pre-dialysis phase most likely during CKD stage 3 or even earlier. Protein energy wasting becomes clinically evident when GFR is less than 15 to 10 ml per minute and 20 to 70 percent of patients on maintenance dialysis show signs of protein energy wasting. Now this is a, a slide from MDRD study 
which shows that there is association of dietary intake and GFR. With declining GFR, that is less than 60 ml per minute, there is an association with higher prevalence of reduced dietary protein and energy intake. As you can see, that protein intake drops as uh, GFR declines and the energy intake also drops as GFR declines. This is again another uh, part of MDRD study which shows that there is an association between serum albumin and the GFR. The serum albumin is lower at levels of GFR less than 60 ml per minute indicating a decline in circulating protein levels or serum protein concentration, protein losses and inflammation. So you can see that the serum albumin is dropping down as the GFR is decreasing. Now, what are the criteria for diagnosing protein energy wasting? They are serum albumin less than 3.8 grams per deciliter, serum prealbumin level less than 30 milligrams per deciliter, serum cholesterol levels less than 100 milligrams per deciliter, BMI, that is body mass index, less than 22 if the age is above 65 years of age, and BMI less than 23 if the age is less than 65 years of age, and if there is unintentional weight loss, there is muscle wasting, reduced muscle mass, which is 5% in 3 months or more than 10% in 6 months. There is reduced muscle arm muscle circumference, mid-arm muscle circumference. And then the dietary intake is reduced. If there is unintentional low dietary protein intake, that is less than 0.8 grams per kg per day for at least 2 months for maintenance dialysis patients, or if it is less than 0.6 grams per kg per day for patients with CKD stages 2 to 5 with 5 grams per day of urinary protein loss, then it is diagnostic of protein energy wasting. And also, unintentional low dietary energy intake if it is less than 25 kilocals per kg per day for at least 2 months. So what are the aims of nutritional intervention? The first aim is to diminish accumulation of nitrogenous wastes to prevent appearance of uremic symptoms. Two, to control progression of disease. Three, to limit the metabolic disturbances characteristic of uremia. Then, to maintain adequate nutritional status and delay renal replacement initiation. Improve outcome in CKD patients improve nutrition, build up body stores for good transplant outcome if planned and improve quality of life. Now a word about nutritional status. Monitor nutritional status of CKD patients, identify nutritional deficiencies before they become clinically evident. Um, the NKF KDOKI guidelines say that uh, there is an association of level of GFR with the nutritional status. Patients with GFR less than 60 ml per minute should undergo assessment of dietary protein and energy intake and nutritional status at regular intervals. Use a combination of valid complementary measures to evaluate protein energy nutritional status because there is no single parameter that can provide complete assessment of nutritional status of chronic kidney disease patients. And the clinically useful tools for nutritional assessment are serum albumin, prealbumin, transferrin, which should be evaluated every month. Anthropometry, DEXA, which should be done every six months, edema free body weight, serum lipids, serum total cholesterol, serum bicarbonate, which should be monitored every month, body mass index as and when required, subjective global assessment every six months, and dietary recall and dietary diaries should be maintained every month. Establish baseline for future reference, monitor changes in nutritional status for uh, with the use of longitudinal anthropometric measurements like weight, BMI, upper arm muscle circumference, evaluate water compartments using bioelectrical impedance analysis to establish dry weight of the patient, develop a patient specific nutrition plan and individualize nutritional counseling. Now, with this background, let's have a detailed look uh, at causes of protein energy wasting. Now, uremic toxicity, as we have learned, is the principal cause of protein energy wasting. Spontaneous reduction in protein intake is reported in pre-dialysis patients as renal function declines. 
For each 10, 10 ml per minute decrease in creatinine clearance, there is a subsequent reduction of protein intake by 0 0.064 grams per kg per day. In uremic patients, on conservative treatment or on maintenance dialysis, anorexia and loss of taste cause imbalance between intake and nutritional requirement. As you can see that as the GFR declines, the protein intake also declines here. Anorexia is evidenced by decreased dietary protein intake and decreased dietary energy intake which are hallmarks of kidney failure and this is caused by retention of anorexogenic substances due to uremia, gastric problems, oral manifestations like lack of taste, dryness of mouth, poor dental hygiene and impaired olfactory function. So these studies have shown that anorexia is prevalent in 35 to 55 percent of CKD population. Uremic patients have poor intake of protein and energy intake. It's been shown by several studies and compliance is poor in patients on maintenance hemodialysis and patients on peritoneal dialysis. Now we conducted a study uh, it was a cross-sectional study on CKD patients and we found that the energy intake of these patients was between 18 to 25 kilocals per kg per day and of protein intake was 0.5 to 0.6 grams per kg per day and these patients were malnourished. Here you can see that anorexia reduces oral energy and protein intake, the serum albumins decrease, the creatinine decreases and uh, the BMI decreases and anorexia is also linked to weight loss and muscle mass loss as you can see that as appetite worsens the lean body mass decreases um, and the hand grip strength decreases total fat percent decreases in the body fat mass decreases and the subcutaneous tissues also decrease now as inflammation increases the appetite worsens so as the CRP levels increase you can see with the, worst, with the worsening of appetite everything goes down and the IL-6 cytokines as the concentration increases appetite worsens so all these are responsible for anorexia therefore correct uremic symptoms correct dialysis dose give adequate dialysis and maintain a KT by V urea of 1.2 for hemodialysis patients and 1.7 per week for CAPD patients individualize dialysis prescription. Now this study by Davis has shown that with every 25 percent increase in delivered peritoneal dialysis dose for six months there's increase in KT by V, the dietary protein intake increases, the serum albumin level increases and there is improvement in SGS scores. So in patients on peritoneal dialysis, glucose absorption from dialysis causes suppression of appetite and induces abdominal discomfort as you can see here. Therefore, encourage patients to take small but frequent meals. Eliminate, treat any potentially reversible or treatable condition or medication that might interfere with appetite or cause malnutrition. Medications like phosphate binders may induce loss of appetite. Therefore, discontinue use of phosphate binders for two weeks to see if, the, if appetite improves. While you discontinue phosphate binders, keep your patients on a low phosphate diet. Discontinue use of iron supplements if there are repeated gastrointestinal upsets. Discontinue use of calcium supplements if bowel movements are irregular and because of that the patient is not able to eat. Reduce salt intake for better control of blood pressure to minimize requirement of antihypertensive medication. Minimize use of bio incompatible dialysis solution. PD solutions may also affect residual renal function. Therefore, icodextrin based PD solutions effectively clear small solutes, increase ultrafiltration rates, improve cardiovascular parameters, improve lipid profile and you have a better control of blood sugars. Infections lead to decreased appetite. Therefore prevent infections especially in peritoneal dialysis patients. You can see this is the exit site infection and this is a picture of peritonitis. To maintain good nutritional status impart intense training to patients and attendant for maintaining hygiene. 
prevent metabolic acidosis, maintain serum, serum by carb at 22 mmol per, per liter and evaluate it monthly because metabolic acidosis induces and increases protein catabolism, impairs nitrogen utilization, decreases albumin synthesis, decreases protein synthesis and increases degradation of essential branching amino acids and reduces skeletal muscle protein synthesis. This study by Zeto et al. has shown that clinical improvement in nutritional status follows after correction of metabolic acidosis as protein catabolism decreases. So you can see here that the, the group which was treated with soda by carb had better SGS scores. Preserve residual renal function for proper clearance of middle molecules. Anorexia is more common in patients who have lost residual renal function and has significant independent effect on dietary protein intake. Patients with residual renal function uh, have a higher mean dietary protein intake compared to patients who have lost total residual renal function. Avoid contrasts and toxins which worsen renal function. Avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, aminoglycoside antibiotics and oral phosphate solutions. Aminoglycoside antibiotics used for the treatment of peritonitis and catheter infections should be used with caution. Prevent peritonitis because peritonitis is also associated with decline in residual renal function. Now, anemia also causes generalized weakness and loss of appetite. Therefore, Correct iron profile, supplement folic acid, correct vitamin B12 deficiency, treat chronic infections and secondary hyperparathyroidism, prescribe optimal dose of EPO or erythropoietin stimulating agents, use L-carnitine in EPO resistant anemia. Treat comorbid conditions like diabetes, gastrointestinal disorders and infections to resolve malnutrition. The study by Wong et al. has shown that combined presence of comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease and vascular complications in diabetic CAPD patients along with malnutrition increases mortality in PD patients. Now, let's have a look at what are the nutritional requirements of CKD patients. When you talk of nutritional management, the first thing that comes to mind is fluid management. The most important thing in fluid management is the intake of the patient and the output of the patient. So intake and output charting should be maintained. Intake means oral intake of the patient along with IV infusions and output charting means urine output per 24 hours. Fluid intake includes water with meals, medications or otherwise, tea, coffee, milk, curd, or any other liquid and fluid prescription should be based on previous 24-hour urine output plus 500 ml extra if the patient is dry. However, if the patient is edematous, then the fluid prescription should be based on 24-hour urine output plus 300 ml of extra fluid. KDOKI guidelines recommend that pre-dialysis or stabilized serum albumin should be more than 4 grams per deciliter and serum pre-albumin should be more than 30 milligrams per deciliter. However, the limitation of these two proteins is that they are acute negative phase reactant proteins and so their levels are decreased during inflammation and stress. So we cannot really say that if serum albumin is low, it is only nutritional or is it because of infection or is it because of inflammation. Kenyusa study has shown that the relative risk of death increases with lower serum albumin and worse nutritional status as assessed by SGS and percent lean body mass. For every 1 gram of lower serum albumin concentration, there is an associated 6% increase in relative risk of death. And for every 1 unit lower SG score, there is an associated 25% increase in the relative risk of death. So we should try to maintain albumin at a normal level.
Now let's have a look at nutrient requirements for patient according to the stage of kidney damage. So let's talk about stage 1 kidney damage that is there is presence of protein in urine with normal GFR. Such patients we don't really need to restrict a lot. The energy should be given according to 30 to 35 kilocals depending upon the age of the patient. If the patient is below 30 years of age, uh, below 60 years of age, give him 30, 35 kilocalories per kg body weight per day and if the patient is above 60 years of age then recommend 30 kilocals per kg per day to these patients as this, this class of patient happens to be more sedentary. And if the patient is diabetic then restrict calories to less than 30 kilocals per kg per day. Protein requirement is 0.8 grams per kg per day. Do give your patients water soluble vitamins and minerals as per the recommended dietary allowance. Prescribe low potassium diets for renal patients as high potassium can cause arrhythmia. Low potassium foods should contain less than 100 milligrams per 100 grams of food item. Remove potassium from vegetables by leaching. Now this process is what? Leaching is simple process whereby you chop the washed vegetables and soak them in lukewarm water for half an hour and this is how the potassium which is water soluble gets leached out. And you can prescribe your patients bananas, you can prescribe your patient pear, guava, apple or orange. Now low sodium so uh, diet for renal patients should be prescribed for better control of blood pressure. Avoid foods containing sodium which is more than 100 milligrams per 100 grams. Avoid canned foods and canned fruits. Now let's talk about nutrient requirements for stage 2, 3, 4 and 5 where the kidney damage is there with mild decrease in GFR to severe reduction in GFR. So in this class of uh, patients according to KDOKI guidelines if the GFR is less than 25 give your patient low protein diet that is 0.6 grams per kg per day but if GFR is more than 25 you can give your patient 0.75 grams per kg per day of protein. Energy the same 30 to 35 kilocalories. Restrict phosphorus to between 800 and 1000 milligrams. The non-calcium based phosphate binders with meals should be prescribed. Calcium should be restricted to 1000 to 1500 milligrams per day. Sodium should be restricted to less than 2.4 grams per day and potassium should be given according to 1 milli equal per kg per day. So if your patient weighs 50 kilos then give your patient 50 milli equals of potassium. Cholesterol should be restricted to less than 200 milligrams per day and water soluble vitamins and minerals should be prescribed according to RDA. Treat anemia with folic acid, vitamin B12, iron supplements and ESA. When patient is on maintenance dialysis, decreased dietary protein intake and dialysis associated protein catabolism leads to further derangement of nutritional status. From metabolic point of view, each dialysis session decreases plasma amino acid levels and as a consequence blunts intracellular protein synthesis. So if you have a look at this table, this table is showing you that in every HD session, an, a patient can lose 10 to 12 grams of amino acids and 1 to 3 grams of protein. In patients who are on peritoneal dialysis, in every 24 hours, the patient can lose 2, 2 to 3.5 grams of amino acids and 5 to 15 grams of proteins every day. So you can see that the losses of protein are much higher in peritoneal dialysis patients compared to hemodialysis patients. And the loss of protein is even higher during peritonitis. So here you can see this is the picture of peritonitis. In peritonitis the peri per protein loss can go up to 15 grams per day. These are various studies which are showing that um, during the episode of peritonitis patients lose 9 to 14, 15 grams of protein. Therefore protein intake during peritonitis should be increased from 1.3 to 1.5 grams per kg per day and the energy requirement should be between 25 to 35 kilocals per kg per day. Now patients with high membrane transport characteristics have low serum albumin level because of excessive protein loss, decreased nutritional intake and fluid overload. Therefore they are at increased risk of malnutrition and morbidity. So reverse protein loss. 
Now, this study by Janssen et al. has shown that daily protein loss is a significant negative prognostic factor and may be one of the factors that predisposes to malnutrition and increased peritoneal protein loss. So, factors associated with worst patient survival and mortality are higher age, nutritional status, dietary protein loss, low cholesterol levels, and diabetes. So, patients on dialysis should take high protein diet like chicken, fish, egg. So, this is a biochemical profile of chronic kidney disease patient and this is just to show you what happens when a patient starts dialysis. This is a patient who was not eating well for almost a year and after that he went on to dialysis. The day he had his first dialysis, his serum protein was 5.4 and serum albumin was 3.3. Gradually, as he was on twice or thrice weekly dialysis, his serum albumin and protein level started dropping down. And by the time he started CAPD, his protein level was 5.4 and the serum albumin level had dropped down to 2.8. Now, at this point, this patient started eating extremely well and within six months, his serum albumin um, increased to 4.16 so patients should be on a very high uh, protein diet.